Thank you very much. So the topic I'm going to talk about today is something I didn't present so much of in the past. Um, rather, as I said already, I focus on this kind of work. And this is some research we did in uh, around 2010, 2012. And what you see here on the left is a robot which is being controlled by a, um, a tetraplegic patient. And she has an implant in the motor cortex. And she uses the signals in that motor cortex to control the robot arm. Now, the trick is here, of course, first of all, how do you do the training, the training of the system? You hope the, the human doesn't adapt so much to the, uh, the, the, uh, what's going on. Um, but how do, you, how do you adapt the system in such a way that it reacts to those, um, spinal, th th those spiking data from the cortex in a correct way, and you can do a specific task? Now, what you see here is that the robot, of course, is, is a, a dump machine, and it just follows the commands of the intelligence, and the in intelligence, in quote, unquote, with respect to the rest of the talk. But the intelligence on the right is just doing the sensory processing and generating from that the commands that you have to do to solve a specific task. Now, of course, as you all know, in robotics is usually done in a rather different way. So the classical approach, and this is something we did, did way back in 2004, um, the classical approach is that you have some model of your vision, some model of your environment, some model of your sensors, and you have some uh, model of your task plan or the goal you want to solve, and you combine those two, and they're very low-dimensional tasks, they're like one-dimensional or maybe two-dimensional um, uh, uh, sequences, um, spaces in which you want to do the optimization, and then you use some feedback error control in the configuration space to do that specific task. It's rather straightforward. Now, of course, you can extend that and say, well, rather than having this, this, uh, this model of my, of my um, uh, uh, movement domain, I do the whole thing as an optimization in my sensor domain. I can describe how I want to optimize my task in my sensor space. And if I do that, I can do some kind of um, optimization in that sensor space. And I can do, for instance, visual serving, as shown here by a video which I randomly picked from YouTube. Okay, things got a bit more interesting when you do something like reinforcement learning. So the idea is you have some control task you want to solve, and basically you want to do optimal control in that, uh, in that space, but you can't, and at the bottom showed three, again, more or less randomly selected videos from YouTube um, of uh, two of Jan Peter's lab and one of, uh, from IIT. And the idea is that, well, you, you um, describe your task as some final goal where you want to be, typically written in sensor space. And that final goal, I can't compute it incrementally, but rather what I do is I define a state S, a sensor state S, and I define an action A based on that sensor space, uh, sensor space S. And then um, I do my step and I get the reward. And the goal is to learn some policy which optimizes the or the sum of the future rewards, right? That's typical reinforcement learning, with all of its variations which have been uh, created to optimize that, to make it faster, and so on and so forth, but I don't know anything about reinforcement learning, so I won't tell you that. The problem, however, here, as in the previous one, is that you have your space S, and usually in the real world, S is a high-dimensional space. So typically it's like a camera image, and this camera image has several tens or hundreds of thousands of pixels describing the environment, and with some model, because I know what I want to do, with some model, this can be reduced to maybe a one-dimensional or two-dimensional, or worst case, three-dimensional description of my environment. And also, it's nice to linearize that in your control space so that your learning in, uh, in, in, in the reinforcement domain gets faster. Okay, now, how do you get your S? And that's, that's what my talk is about, basically, um, because in the last few years, there have been some new methodologies um, applied to this problem, and it has been shown by many other labs, and uh, we, we did our own thing, that you can do that quite efficiently nowadays with neural networks. So, next topic. What's a neural network? I, I, I assume here that not everybody knows what a neural network is and what the tricks of it um, are. Um, I've got two slides on this. And the first slide shows you the neural networks until, let's say, the turn of the century, approximately. 
Um, we, well, many people know the, the history in the 1960s. We had the, the linear neural networks and then uh, the discovery they can't do the XOR. Um, so they can't do nonlinear things. And then a nonlinear extension in forms of backpropagation, uh, which finds the, the uh, parameters of your neural network, was found in the 70s, 80s. And then late 80s and uh, beginning 90s, neural networks were immensely popular, funded by everybody, and the expectations were huge. And there were a lot of papers around the 1990s showing that uh, a single layer of hidden neurons in a neural network can approximate any function. Now that's very nice because that saves your computational time, it saves your complex, co complexity, and it saves you the choice of how many of these things you have to use. So everybody used that and uh, we were all very happy. But in the end it didn't really work out so well because, well, they were too slow in learning, but even worse, neural networks can't do everything and they don't generalize your data sets very well. So that's a really big problem. Um, support factor machines then were uh, very popular in the late 1990s, but also they in high dimensional spaces do not always come up to their expectation. Second page, the new stuff. So um, starting approximately about 2000, the probabilistic uh, machine learning was getting more and more pop popular, and that means that rather than looking at a neural network or, or machine learning as um, mapping one data on another, data point, you rather try to map distribution, probability distributions on probability distributions. Now, 2006 seminal paper showed that if you add more layers to your neural network, you can do more. And it's actually, in hindsight, is of course very obvious because, well, what those hidden units do is they find some representation of your, um, uh, some features in your data and those features, well, they, they can be very nice, but to, 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 to map those to an output, you have to have a very smart system. So it's nicer to take features of features and maybe features of features of features. So you stack layers of hidden units on top of each other and um, you can do more. The trick back then, however, was that training those things is very problematic back then. And um, uh, restricted Boltzmann machines uh, from Hinton's group then were used to do a pre-training and uh, then after training with backpropagation and it was shown to be a very powerful system. 2009 this was extended if you just train long enough and you do some regularization and you have a good computing power and you have many, many data, which is true nowadays with uh, databases like Google have and other people can get. If you have enough computing power and you have enough data, you can actually do, with backpropagation, do the training of neural networks. An important thing, 2012, dropout, which I will explain later, to um, prevent overfitting to regularization. 2012 as well, convolution neural networks, I'll show you a slide on that later on. They started beating many, many of the vision ben benchmarks, leading to a situation where many vision research groups switched to neural networks to do their work. Recurrent neural networks became stable. So training of recurrent neural networks is possible nowadays and extending to that probabilistic neural networks which do not compute this to the output but the expectation and the variance of an output have become um, common uh, knowledge and, and practicable. And then indeed starting 2014 you see quite some applications in robotics or maybe 2013. Okay, just summing up. So this is a neural network, uh, 1990s. You have an input factor X and you want to map that to an output factor Y and you go th through some layer of nonlinear functions, the hidden layer. All right, and the parameters W1, W2 and so on, they are found by, by optimization, it's called backpropagation to do that. And as said, extending that to multiple layers and more layers still, and you, you can go on with that. There's no, no end to this story yet. People like to go up to six, but there are some recent discoveries that 15 are also nice. Um, if you add more layers, um, you get a more complex thing, and you can, um, you can do much better generalization of your data. But of course, the problem is you have many, many uh, connections. And a question I get often asked, well, if you have a neural network with so many connections, shouldn't you have two 
samples per, per, per parameter to get uh, good estimates. Well, that's not true in, in this literature, and, and the comparison to that I like to give is that, well, a human brain with 10 to the power uh, 11 neurons and 10 to the power 12 or 13 uh, connections has only about 10 to the power 9 seconds to live. So there must be a way of regularizing that and solving that, even though you don't have uh, data for each and every sample in uh, the parameter in your neural network. Okay, I mentioned uh, dropout. The idea of dropout is that during training, what you do is that you are randomly selecting neurons which you switch off. And if you switch off a neuron, then what you prevent is that several neurons try to learn the same thing. Because one sample, the one neuron is active, another sample, the other neuron is active. And that gives you a very good regularization for a very cheap price. So that was one of the other large discoveries in 2012. And with those two ingredients, you can do pretty damn much. Okay, um, one more extension. This is then, uh, maybe not an extension, but a different type of neural network. The difference is that between the hidden units, and I didn't draw them all in this picture because you wouldn't see anything anymore, but between the hidden units, you can add additional parameters, additional connections, so you get uh, a more complex network, which, however, has a memory, it has an internal state, and that system allows you not to represent just samples, but it allows you to actually represent data because it has an internal state and can uh, learn time series for you. And that also can be extended to a system where you don't just learn the, the, the output, but you learn the distribution of the output. And that's actually a very powerful thing because what you can do now is say, well, rather than looking at mapping from the input, and I, I, I compute uh, an output of that, I can also compute the variance, so the, the, the expectation, but also the variance of my expectation value. So I know I can make a prediction, and I can see how good is that prediction, how sure is my neural network about this prediction. Okay. And if the introduction. One special case is the autoencoder. Very old thing, also made in the 1990s, and the idea is very simple. You have... A, ordinary neural network, but the input equals the output. So you input your parameter x and you try to have the system learn uh, to map that input x to the output equal to x again. Now the trick in this one is that rather than having just a normal neural network, you have one which, is, uh, which has a bottleneck in the middle. And you see this middle, I wrote a low dimensional manifold or what we call the latent space. And this latent space is some low dimensional representation of, your, um, of your, your, your data, which is so good that it can actually reconstruct the data again. Now the nice thing is this thing does of course unsupervised learning. I need only my data, I don't need targets, but I need only my data to find a representation in some latent space of the same data. As a small aside, we've been uh, using this model in combination with uh, um, dynamic movement primitives um, in a paper we are publishing at the Humanoids uh, this year. Uh, and what we do is we use the, the we, we train the parameters of the dynamic movement primitives, and we can use those to generate spaces, uh, generate movement in my complex space X, but they're actually generated in a low-dimensional manifold. So by by looking at my movement in my low-dimensional manifold, I can map those with my autoencoder on my complex original space, which can be images or which can be movements. Lecture is almost over. Um, the variational autoencoder is one extension to this autoencoder in which, again, we don't learn just the, the, the expectation of the output, but also the variance. And it has a nice additional trick that you see in the middle, the loss equals the construction plus KL latents uh, versus inputs. That means that we compute, this system computes, it's, uh, it's introduced by King Mountain Welling in 2013, uh, this system computes the uh, kullback leitler divergence between the latents and the input, and that means that um, this thing is, is maximized, and the kullback leitler divergence actually expresses the, dissimilar, the similarity of two probability distribution. So by maximizing these, what I make sure is that the 
uh, probability distributions in my latent space is as perpendicular as possible with respect to my data. The thing, in fact, does a nonlinear PCA, more or less. Now, that's a very powerful thing, because in the middle, I have my latent space, and I have probability distributions there, and I can use these probability distributions to generate output. If I cut away the encoder and I only use the decoder, I can make a mapping from my latent space, my low dimensional two, three, five dimensional space, to some highly complex high dimensional space and generate useful movements or whatever it is I'm looking at. Last slide of the lecture, the convolution neural network. I mentioned that before. I don't want to get into the details, but it is again a specific uh, architecture of neural network. Um, and this one is again basically a normal uh, deep neural network, but it uses um, these convolutions on the input layer and the convolutions of a certain um, uh, feature map creates the second layer and the convolution of a feature map on that layer creates a third and so on and so forth. The difference between standard methods such as SIFT is that those feature maps are being learned. And you see on the, on the bottom right um, the, 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 the uh, feature maps that are being learned by a specific um, neural network. So you see that in the first layer the feature map actually, for instance, codes lines as you would find also in right shaft detectors, and the second might uh, uh, create uh, squares or circles, and so on and so forth. All right, now why is this relevant? The relevance is, for instance, in the second, uh, the, the next video, and what you see here is some work uh, from Ian Lenz and, uh, and other people at Cornell 2013, and what they did is they took the raw images of, um, of a, a large number of objects, and trained a convolutional neural network to generate graphs from that. Now, in this case, the graphs which are being learned are coming from a database. So it's, a, I, I don't know how they made a database, but it is, a, um, so let's say, a human teacher which selects the graphs on those objects, and the convolutional neural network learns to map the raw image data directly through uh, um, uh, to the possible graphs, and they put an extra neural network on that, which selects the most typical, the most uh, efficient grasp on top of that. And that's a very nice system because, well, of course, the training takes a while. You're talking about a few hours of training these data. But after that, the generalization of the system to unknown objects, to unknown scenes and unknown areas is wonderful and allows you to use that in a very wide variety of uh, applications. So um, this was one of the first papers in that area. And um, I'm going to show you a few other ones. But basically, if you look at the application of these things, this is just, a, again, a random selection of papers. You will find more than these if you, if you look far enough. Um, but especially in the last few years, of the, in the last year, I must say, um, there is quite some work on end-to-end -end learning of vision in a robotic system. I'll give you one example, and this is work uh, from uh, uh, Peter Abel's group, and they have two presentations at the IRS, so I'd really advise you to look at those. But basically what they've been doing, if they've, they've been using these convolutional neural networks in, uh, in five or six layers, and they use that to map it directly to motor torques to grasp an object, or to uh, do a coat hanging, or do this kind of insertion. And the trick is that in this case, um, the visual features which are being learned directly by looking at the data and looking at the images are combined to the torques using reinforcement learning. So you have an input, the raw data, and you have the output, the motor torques, and the whole thing is being learned autonomously without any um, user intervention. Of course, you have to, to define the final goal, but nothing more than that. And as you've seen in the video, it is rather robust to introducing clutter in the images, changing the images, and so on and so forth, and also it fails in some time. So it's, it's really, it's been one of the most impressive works um, uh, in, the, in the last few months with respect to this end-to-end -end learning. Okay, um, another paper which came out a few weeks ago 
is a different approach uh, from Unifreiburg and Google DeepMind in which um, the end-to-end -end learning is done by running optimal control in the set latent space. So you make a latent space based on your visual input and that latent space is, can be used in a low dimensional way to do optimal control. I won't get into the somewhat complex details here because I don't have so much time left anymore. So what if you do something else than vision? And we've been looking at tactile sensors. So um, what you see here on the right is, is a very simple uh, robot, very nasty, uh, unstable dynamics and so on, but it, it runs all the same. And what we did is we mapped the tactile data, which we got from the biotech sensor, which you don't see in the hand over there. Um, and this biotech sensor gives us a 19-dimensional uh, feature space um, on which we want to do reinforcement learning to do this kind of um, stabilization. And you see here a very simple, simple example of how that works. But basically, the trick is, first of all, you get this 19-dimensional texel space, you map that with a variational autoencoder on a two-dimensional hyperspace, which you don't know what it's going to be, and then in this two-dimensional hyperspace, you can do optimal control. Um, reinforcement learning, excuse me. Now what you see, and this is one picture of, uh, of one simple one-dimensional uh, approach where we show on the, on the bottom left, we show the uh, representation that we find in the autoencoder uh, latent space. And what you see there is that the system actually encodes the uh, angle of the, uh, um, of the pendulum but then, of course, based on tactile space. So it's, it quickly learns to represent that data and after not even all that many um, iterations, it can actually do this stabilization. I must apologize for the video, you might not have noticed, but it's only one dimension. We have a two dimensional running, but not, not when I was filming this a few days ago. What else can you do? So we thought, well, let's look at something more challenging. And, um, to do that, we decided to look at the uh, Bry uh, coding of characters and see if we can read it. Again, we used the biotech sensor. So as I said, we knew, uh, used 19 texts of that. Actually, we used uh, the newer generation of that. Um, but you will have um, a dictionary of uh, 57 characters you will find in your uh, Bry code. And we tried to map that on text with a robotic system. Now, it's, it's a bit difficult to do that. If you look at the dimensions, um, the finger compared to the characters is relatively large. So that's, that's a bit bitchy, but we didn't want to go to a large bry, especially since it is rather difficult to get from the printers. We use the same very simple robotic system. So you see the biotech sensor at the front um, in, in a supporting wrist to, to regularize the uh, force between the biotech and the, and the braille, um, and a linear motor plus a four degree of freedom and a factor position to control. Now there are a few tasks we have to solve to do that, and the first task we wanted to solve is uh, basically to find where the tactile data is, where are the uh, interesting spots on the page. And the thing on the top basically does that feel. Now we have the same um, symbols as before, so I have some, some action A which brings my system from state S to state S prime. And this um, information equation, that's basically information or, or, or the, uh, the Shannon channel capacity is basically what gives us that. But it's problematic. This one is the same KL divergence, as I mentioned before, between my, uh, um, between my previous state and my next state. And we want to maximize basically the information gain while moving over the page. Now, what's the trick? Usually you have to solve these kind of probability distribution by sampling. And sampling is too expensive, especially if a robot is involved. So what we did instead is we used um, a probabilistic neural network, the one I quickly showed before, um, and we fed those with latent variables from a variational autoencoder of the tactile data. So we take the tactile data, I put it in a variational autoencoder, I get uh, statistic independence, probabilistic independence between my variables, those I put in a, um, a probabilistic neural network, and a probabilistic neural network computes those things. Do the same for that, 
And you see in the right, you see what happens if you use that method for a pole balancing. Just by moving around, the system finds that the most interesting states where the most information is to be gained is when the pole is in the center. We can do the same for um, that uh, page of, of, uh, of Braille by just moving randomly over the page, more or less randomly, I must say, and you can see the movements on the page on the left, that's the, the page of text, then the system can compute where the most interesting information is, and that's the red areas. So basically it learns to do line following. And um, the, um, the, the, the computation of that entropy, that channel entropy, I have uh, three more slides, um, is, on the, uh, is depicted here, um, the right picture is when you are actually centered on the taxel, so you see that's the maximum entropy. And if you move it to the left or to the right, it will directly tell you while you're moving where your uh, information is. Um, how do you translate then these dots to characters? And I will skip this video also in the sense of time, and I'll just skip maybe this one as well. But you get this information, you get these tactile data while you're following the line, and now you have to make that into characters. Now this is, uh, again, a variational autoencoder um, uh, recording of those taxels. You can see the red bits contain most information. But in the end, we decided to use, again, a recurrent neural network to input the, the taxel information and then output um, the prediction of those taxels. And let's skip all of the figures except the bottom one, because that's the result. And you see in the first row, you see of those two times three matrices of pixels, you see the real character and the prediction. We get approximately 91% dot accuracy, and we get 59% character accuracy. Doesn't sound like much, but if you then actually use that and you look at your probabilistic neural network, what the first and the second and the third most likely prediction is, then you'll see that, for instance, in the, in, in the word on the left, all of the characters except for one is right and the other one is the second best choice. So if you add on top of that a word recognition model, which are easy to get by nowadays, then this thing is solved. So, it's a tough thing because of the wrong sensor um, for this kind of resolution, but still you get some reasonable uh, results by doing end-to-end -end learning. And actually I have to thank all of these people who did this, uh, built this demonstration in the last uh, five or six weeks, and of course all the other members in my lab and the funding agencies. Thank you very much. We're running late. Only two uh, minutes over. Only two minutes, yeah. So we have time for one question, or maybe even two, while our next speaker is setting up. But maybe this was... Um, yes, please, come, go to the microphone number three and ask your question. Um, thank you for the presentation, Professor. So uh, I think one of the competitors for deep learning is uh, non-parametric models, such as Gaussian process, or deep hierarchies of Gaussian process. So, um, do you have any comments about using those for robotics? Um, the, so, the advantage of the Gaussian process is that you don't need so many data. Yes, the, yes. The disadvantage is that, does, that it doesn't work with many data. So, the results with neural networks are better in general. Um, indeed, neural networks, in the way I presented them here, they require very many data and long training. Uh, we actually, th there are um, something, uh, some models coming up, uh, Bayesian um, neural networks, which take care of regularization in the weights, and that solves that, that big data problem. So, um, um, uh, uh, GPs are nice if you can use them. They're costly to train, um, and neural networks are usually more performant. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other question? I mean, we are probably, this is only the beginning of a, uh, a long development, deep learning and robotics. I think that's quite obvious. But um, it's also tough and hard stuff, as we saw in this presentation. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.